Welcome to Central News for Thursday the 27th of June. I'm Hilary Entwistle. In today's news, Mowal will be managed jointly by Tauranga City Council and Mowal Trust after a memorandum of understanding between both parties was approved. The MOU was approved by the Mowal Trust in May this year and received a similar, similar endorsement by TCC at Monday's council meeting. The new agreement does not affect public access to Mowal, which is protected and will continue. One of the new board's functions will to be to review the reserve management plan that is in place for Mowal. The Bay Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Group has appointed its first full-time group controller, Clinton Nord. All councils in the Bay of Plenty, Regional Council, Tauranga City, Western Bay of Plenty, Whakatane, Kawaro, Opotsuki and Rotorua are members of the Civil Defence Emergency Management Group. The group is chaired by Opotsuki Mayor John Forbes, who said the Mayors and Regional Council, Regional Council Chair of the Joint Committee were pleased to appoint a Regional Manager. The group has a shared office that coordinates day-to-day -day planning and project work for the CDEM group. During peacetime, when there are no emergencies, he manages the office in the role of regional CDM manager, reporting to all the councils. In an emergency, the roles reverse, and as group controller, he is in charge of managing all the council's response, coordinating people, information and resources during the emergency, and advising local controllers. Now, for our region's weather, it is pretty similar for both of our centres on Friday. Hamilton fine with a southeasterly easing. Your expected high is 12 and your overnight low is possibly the lowest we have seen this year. It is minus one. Tauranga, your Friday will be fine with the southeasterly easing. Your expected high is 14 and an overnight low of three. Just ahead, the psychological effects of domestic violence. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. Research for a new master's thesis will be focusing on the psychological effects of domestic violence. We chatted with psychology student Claire Troon to find out more about her in-depth investigation. In your research, what specifically are you focusing on? So this research is being conducted through the Hamilton Abuse Intervention Project and that's a coordinated community intervention project which is focused on providing stopping presence programs for men who are perpetrators of domestic violence, but also providing support and advocacy for women and children who are the victims of that violence. So this research specifically looks at understanding more about the perceptions of men who are perpetrators of domestic violence, on the impact of violence on their children, on the mothers of those children, and also on their ability to be a parent or father to those children. Why are you researching this particular topic? So first and foremost, domestic violence is a significant issue within New Zealand and that's well established throughout the current statistics. Um, in terms of looking at parenting in the context of domestic violence in particular, we still need to know a lot more about the impact of the batterer's parenting style on children and that's why I chose to focus my research on this area. And that also leads to understanding more about um, the appropriate interventions for these men. What have you found out so far? So the initial findings suggest that in terms of the impact on the children, there's significant emotional impact and that includes an inability to express their emotions in appropriate ways. There's also some social learning in there, so children learning the batterers' uh, tactics of power and control and using these in a variety of contexts. Children have also taken on different roles within the family, so becoming the protector for their mother, but also taking on a parent's role within the family. In terms of the impact of violence on women's ability to be a mother, the women speak of uh, being disregarded as a mother by the abuser and the impact that has on her emotionally. But also um, they, the women in particular talk about manipulation that they've experienced throughout the court system and what that can mean in terms, terms of access and contact arrangements they have with their children. Um, the men and women both in looking at the impact of violence on parenting in particular they uh, spoke of the men's inactiveness as a parent, but also spoke of authoritarian parenting practices, so the men using harsh or strict parenting practices with their children. And that really reflects the um, use of power and control, not only against or with the, their partners or ex-partners, the women, but also in the context of parenting their children. 
Well, for researching all this information, is there anything that was unexpected or surprised you? Well, in terms of the initial findings, there was nothing really unexpected um, based on what we already know in the current literature. However, I was surprised at the insight that the men had in terms of their parenting style and their ability to see how violence and parenting are interrelated in that context. Have you had any help with your research? So I've had quite a lot of help and support. So my Chief Supervisor, Neville Robinson, he was really the first person who inspired me to undertake research within the area of family violence. And also my second supervisor, Kate Curtis, also brings a woman's perspective to this research. And I've also had the ongoing support of staff and the Trust Board at HAPE, um, which has been very important as this research also needs to be beneficial for them as an organisation. When about will the research be completed? So it's anticipated that this research will be completed by the end of the year. Tell me about the scholarships you were awarded to help with your research. So there's, the first scholarship was through the New Zealand Family Violence Clearinghouse and that was a fees bursary scholarship to pay for my fees for this thesis and that really reflects their ongoing support of research within the area of family violence in New Zealand. And the second one is through the Waikato Health Memorabilia Trust and that is due to the fact that this research will look at the significant mental health and wellbeing consequences for women and children as well as the healing processes that need to take place in the aftermath of violence. How have you managed to do your masters and study for your second year clinical psychology program? So a balanced approach is really needed. So I've need, I have to remain dedicated to the clinical program, but also just as dedicated and passionate about my master's research, which I have been doing for a year and a half now. And I think the main thing for me is focusing on my long-term goals, and that is to become a clinical psychologist, but also to be an active and dedicated researcher within my career as a clinical psychologist. Do you have any regrets about your big workload? No, I don't have any regrets. Um, I think it was anticipated that at this level it would be expected that I would need to make some sacrifices in other areas of my life and I wouldn't have been able to do it without the support of my family, my partner and my friends and understanding that this is my priority at the moment. How will these findings contribute to your project? So in terms of understanding more about family violence in New Zealand in particular, these findings will be quite useful in knowing more about how we can um, use interventions with these men in terms of their parenting also. So not just their violent behaviour against women and their relationships, but also the significant implications for men parenting their children, and that includes having unsupervised and supervised access to their children after the relationship has ended or when the court decides what happens there. So in terms of that, um, the men and women also spoke about their understanding of whether or not men should in fact have contact with their children after the relationship has ended and what capacity that should be. And so it was quite divided. Some women and men said that yes, children do need their fathers and there needs to be that ongoing relationship. And some women and men also spoke about them not, not wanting there to be contact until they've made significant changes in their behaviour, not only through stopping violence programmes, but in terms of their parenting specifically. Just ahead, reading superheroes. Welcome back. Two Te Poi primary school teachers have been presented the National Library of New Zealand Reading Superhero Awards by Waikato MP Lindsay Tish. The awards were presented to the pair after children from the school had nominated them. We talked to the Reading Superhero teachers to find out what made their students think they're so super. So Casey, tell me why did you decide to nominate your reading teachers for the award? Well, I decided to nominate my grandma and grandma Pam because um, before I even started school she, we would have grandma days and she would read to me lots of books but one of my favourites was Witch in the Cherry Trees because at the end of the book it would have a recipe and we'd always make the cookies. So. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good perk <laughs> to reading. And uh, Nikisha, what sort of things do you do in your reading class? Well, we have book box time after morning tea and we would come in after morning tea and then we would get our book box out and have a little read and I, the, my favourite bit about book box time was when you get new books because once you've finished your whole box of books you get a new lot of books and they're always new and interesting books. Oh, awesome. And so do you both have a favourite book? Casey, we'll start with you. 
Um, well, my favourite book is Witch in the Cherry Tree because yeah. of what I said before. Um, and Graham would always put lots of expression into it and... Make the book come alive. Yeah. yeah. And what about you, Nikisha? My book, my favourite book is an animal book that I used to read when I was in Wing Free. Mm -hmm. And I really loved it because it tells you all about the animals that live in the forest and the pet animals and all that. Ah, it sounds like an awesome book. Well, thank you very much for having a chat and we're going to have a chat with your teachers now to find out a bit more about the award. Well, it sounds like the teachers at Tapoi School really go above and beyond to find great incentives to get their kids reading. So we're going to have a chat to Sandra and Pam about the award. So can you tell me a little bit about the Superhero Award that you've just won? Competition run by the National Library of New Zealand and it would have been nationwide. I think um, one of the reasons we maybe made it through to the final was that there were multiple nominations. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so, Pan, tell me, how did it feel to, to get nominated? Well, it was a bit mind-blowing, really. Um, I, didn't, didn't, I didn't know about the award and was just told to be at the school um, for assembly on Friday, um, and there was something exciting happening. So I bowled up there, and, um, yeah, the superhero was... Reading Superhero Award was um, presented. It was... Yeah, just blew me away, really. Oh, it's very exciting. So, can you tell me a little bit about the focus that you have on reading at Tapoi School? Well, I go up on a Monday. Um, it's it's a fun day for me uh, in, into Sandra's room. Um, I've, I started doing it when my grandchildren started there, probably six six or seven years ago, um, and it, it was it was just fun. It's a lovely way to get to know the children and to, to have fun with them and to encourage them with, with reading. Mm, definitely. So, Sandra, tell me, how important do you think reading is for children? I think reading is vital for children and for their, um, just an awareness of the world, being who they are, achieving. I think research has shown that children who read well usually do well in life as mm. well. Opens up new doors for them. Mm. Yeah. Now, what sort of things do you do to motivate the kids to read? You just, just talk to them, talk to them about things. Um, even if they don't read the words, you, you discuss pictures and draw them out and, and try and relate it to their experiences as well. And, and they, they love reading words um, and before long they're reading sentences and then they're into books. So. The story's a bit of an adventure really. Yeah. So it starts off and it's exciting and it's great when Pam comes up because she can sometimes do things that I wouldn't if I didn't have help. So there's one little book with a treasure hunt in so they always do the treasure hunt. Yeah. There's other little fun things you can do around stories that just make it that much more enticing to want to read. Mm, mm -hmm. Definitely and that's how Casey was saying as well that there's mm -hmm. a book about uh, making biscuits so at the end of the book you'll make biscuits which yes. is a really good incentive to uh, read that book I think. Mm -hmm. So have you got any other secrets to, to get kids to read just, just show your your love of books and, and words and reading and it just encourage them encourage them they don't have to get every word right or anything like that but if they if you can show them that you like books and Nikisha mentioned the book boxes well that's a really special time because the the children they often pick books that they know very well and they read over and over again and they just love being able to show you how they can read and it's just really really nice we're really lucky today there are so many different publishers and books so there's a book out there for every child mm. um, there's different interests there's fiction there's non-fiction and we use those for recreational reading and with instructional reading yeah exactly mm. because kids they they like a whole range of books they're not all going to mm. like the same book so what sort of things do you do to try and cater to all the children well, we should try and share a range of different texts. Um, as I said, with um, instructional reading, there's quite a few little... It might be a non-fiction one about an insect, or it might be a fiction one about the bears going fishing. And then with your um, unit study, you might at the moment we're reading about space and the moon, and we're reading those sorts of books about the first Apollo mission or something. So there's a whole range. And then in the library, graphic fiction's come in a lot the last few years, so probably our parents called it comics, mm -hmm. <laughs> comic-like books. But some mm -hmm. children really love books that are set out in that style. Mm -hmm. Some children when they're really good readers still love sophisticated picture books because they like the illustrations. So there's books out there for everybody. Mm. Mm. And so just briefly, what, what sort of tips do you have for parents to read with their kids at home? What should they be doing? Well, just to read to them, even if it's reading nursery rhyme mm. books at night, every night to read a story to them 
and if you if you haven't got a book just have a, have a talk with them just spend time with them with words and yeah, read, reading to them is absolutely vital. Stay tuned as after the break we discuss the new alcohol policy for the Bay with Mia Stuart Crosby. If you've just joined us, welcome to Central News. The new draft alcohol policy will see longer hours for bars and stricter rules for off-licences. I spoke with Mayor Ross Patterson of the Western Bay District Council and the police for their views on the policy earlier this week. Tonight, we discuss with Mayor Stuart Crosby of the Tauranga City Council. So what are the proposed changes to opening times in the large Tauranga area? Well, for what we call, I guess people understand them as bars, etc., and tavern licences, uh, at the moment there's 3 a.m. closing in Tauranga and 1 a.m. in Mount Maunganui. So after quite a long discussion, we've decided, subject to consultation and a final decision, uh, to have a 3 a.m. uniform closing time across the whole city, that's including Mount Maunganui and Tauranga, and in fact Greater Western Bay as well but also uh, have a 2 a.m. one-way door policy. So what that means is uh, from 2 a.m. onwards, between 2 and 3, if you go into an establishment and leave, then you can't go into another one. So the theory behind that, and some people say it works, some people say it doesn't, is that then you have a, a, a dispersal time over an hour, not all at once. What was the process for making that decision? Uh, well, all councils up and down New Zealand are going through this process. It's to do with the new liquor licensing legislation, which is giving local communities a little bit more power in decision making, which is good. Uh, so we did some pre-consultation before we started to make those draft decisions, uh, and it was mixed. You know, some people said, um, keep it the way it is. There were concerns about more alcohol, then there'd be more violence, etc., etc. The DHB had some input, the police had some input. So we've taken all that on board and now are looking at going out to the community with that particular proposal. Also, in what people know as liquor stores, there are some changes there as well. Will this impact on CBD drinkers? Not so much on the Taronga Entertainment Strip, we call it, which is down on the Strand. Uh, at the moment, they're 3 a.m. anyway. A three, so the, the change there will be the potential 2 a.m. one-way door policy. And um, I, my view is we should at least trial that for one or two years, see what happens, see if it works, uh, and then constantly review our liquor licensing just to make sure that uh, what we do change is actually working. Because the whole thrust of the new legislation is harm minimisation, and we do know that New Zealand does have some pretty terrible drinking statistics. There was an alcohol survey at the beginning of this year, so what were the main concerns? That was part of that pre-consultation. Uh, from the police's perspective, for example, it was about uh, resources to actually police a wider district that has a longer closing time, and I understand that. Uh, from the DHB's perspective, they highlighted some quite significant health issues for p people potentially drinking for a longer time. Uh, but from the positive side, or the other side, I guess, the uh, establishment owners and licensees said uh, it made their business more viable and also that they could actually manage uh, the situation with proper staffing, etc., and resources. There is also that argument that some people actually start, don't start to go out until like uh, 11 uh, at night anyway, and that's true, um, depending on the generational thing. So I was trying to cater for all age groups uh, in a controlled situation. And finally, there is that issue that is it a safer environment to be at uh, in a bar where there is uh, bar people watching the amount you consume and security, etc., or people getting uh, a carload of alcohol and going to a public reserve or uh, a less controlled establishment and, uh, and drinking quite heavily. So there's a whole range of issues and a whole range of arguments. Are there any submissions that the council will choose to act on? Uh, again, it's mixed. It's, it's, it's very difficult just to pluck out one and say, well, that's the silver bullet and that's going to solve um, particularly the binge drinking issue that we do have in uh, New Zealand and in Tauranga as well. Uh, so I can't actually answer that question specifically to say, yes, we've picked out that, we've put it in here and that will work. My personal view is that there will be a range of issues over a period of time that will start to unwind the poor culture we have with regard to alcohol in New Zealand. So the police actually oppose the decision not to look at licensed premises in industrial areas. 
Do you think that you will look at that again before the final draft is put through? Quite possibly. Uh, we don't see that as being uh, an issue that will create a proliferation of uh, bars, for example, in our industrial areas. We have one or two already. Uh, they seem to fly under the radar. It's more about people on the way home from work being able to go there and have a drink before they actually go home. Not that they'll be open till 1 to 3 a.m. in the morning. This is a unique joint policy where you and the Western Bay Plenty have got together. Why did you guys decide to join forces? We're doing a lot together now and we've been doing a lot together for a long time so this is quite a challenging one uh, because from Waihi Beach through the CBD in Tauranga through to Mount Monganui out to Pokahina, there are different communities and they actually have different needs and they've had different uh, circumstances up till today. So to merge those is, is quite a challenge, but we are doing it and we're getting there. Why is this policy being fast-tracked? It's really driven by the timeframes and the legislation. Uh, it's theoretically supposed to be finished by November, December, uh, when the licensees have to start to reapply. It's a very tight time frame, but what also concerns us is the cost to the ratepayers if in the legislation there aren't sufficient provisions for us to recoup the costs of this whole process, particularly the application to licence. Some people are saying that these longer hours and these changes will actually have a negative impact on that binge drinking culture. Will you try and address that again before the final draft is put through? The binge drinking culture uh, has come from a history of, uh, first and foremost, the availability of alcohol through off licences, that's liquor stores, and the pricing of alcohol becoming a lot cheaper, in my view, and also the lack of parental control. So there's a whole range of things that have created this binge drinking culture, and it's been around a long, long time. So you don't think that longer hours will have an impact? I don't think so. I think that longer opening hours in the bars, for example, will actually allow people to drink and associate uh, in a controlled environment rather than an uncontrolled environment. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have news including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I'll be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around our regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.